for that. But uh, my sense tonight would be just that I'm so blessed to have both of you in our lives, actually, both Brother David and you, Hendrik, and realizing, Hendrik, you're away from your wife at the minute. You're stranded uh, in Holland, unable to get back to Tia, who's in Colombia and Calais. So that, is it three months you've been away? Yeah, this has been a longer, we, have, we haven't seen each other uh, for three months, which has been long before. Wow. Uh, you know, we, we have decided to uh, be patient and trust the Lord and wait until the door opens again without uh, you know, going into a lot of trouble and difficulties, uh, trying to get to Colombia or vice versa. Uh, is, we uh, trust in the Lord. Amen, amen. And it's amazing, again, through the technology, you're at least able to see each other at the moment. Yeah, yeah, definitely. A blessing compared to who was left for Colombia. We wrote letters back and forth and it took like six weeks to get an answer. Wow. But now we blessed by <laughs> all this new technology now. Amen, amen. Um, yeah, so there's a wee bit of crackle, just I think between the signals, between um, Holland and the other place, but we'll persevere. Hopefully people will be able to pick out most of what, what's being said here. And my heart tonight would be just a, in a sense, this is what happened in Bolivia, for instance, where just, there was all the services, but often there were times when we just sat around, often later night just eating, and the Lord was present in those conversations. So really for people watching here on, on Facebook, that the, just the eavesdropping on this conversation, I'll try and get out of the way actually, because I want to eavesdrop as well. And often that word generals in the faith is used and it can be used different ways. But for me, you both of you are the, that type of apostolic people, that just the generals in, in the Lord and just the, what you do and what you've done and what you continue to do. So just, I'm just extremely blessed uh, just to be able to have uh, this time with you. And again, just as you're watching tonight, just pick up, as you can, just wee bits of what the Lord might be saying through this conversation. Does that sound okay, Dean? That sounds fine. And uh, and provided the people can hear us okay. Can you hear me now, Fergus? Can you? I can. There's there's a few people saying it's a wee bit crackly, but um, hopefully we'll be able to pick up most of what we can. If you, if, Henrik, if you may, need to come a wee bit closer to, to your phone, maybe, just for sound. Would that help? Okay. That's a bit better. That's great. Yeah. So let's let's get straight into it. And again, just you guys share as the Lord leads you. But Lord, just thank you for this evening. And thank you for gathering us here in this way. Thank you for everybody who'd be watching online right now and people who would watch later on. Just thank you, Lord, that you're God who connects. And Lord, even though we're thousands of miles apart, that you draw close to us. And thank you, Lord, for all that we hear and see of what you're doing through this time. And Lord, just as we share this evening, as we listen this evening, Lord, just flavor this time with your Holy Spirit. And Lord, just uh, just touch each person watching at their very point of need. And Lord, in this conversation, we bring Tia all the way back in Colombia. And Lord, just we bless her uh, at this point in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So Amen. if you guys just... Feel free to share. Maybe, Henrik, what's going on in your heart at the moment as, as you're, you're almost like on a long-term retreat in Holland there at the minute, unable to return to Colombia. What's, what's been on your heart through all of this? Well, it's been the time of life for being away from Tay and from Colombia has been difficult. But on the other hand, I've had a wonderful time in quarantine, you know, reading away from, from a lot of work and business. And uh, sometimes it's really good to go back to the basics and uh you know just uh, have a very simple style and and be in so many things that god is discovering really and uh, looking at brother david and seeing his picture here on zoom <laughs> just so many memories brother david is coming you know we have shared i still remember meeting you in that meeting there in northern Ireland, one of my early trips when you had just come back from Baffin Island and I heard about you. And I, I went over to Brother David and I was expecting him to come up with a lot of requirements uh, when I invited him to Colombia. And all he said was, I only need an invitation. And I had 
tremendous with Brother David coming over and other people from Northern Ireland. And it's really been a life-changing experience for me. Well, it has been, it has really been life-changing for me, uh, Hendrik, as well. I was just trying to write down one or two memories, really, of our trips out there. I think we first went to you in 2008, and the last trip that we made was to Bolivia in uh, 2018. If I can just say to people who don't know those countries that Colombia was always a dangerous experience, and in Cali, the local people would never allow us to go out on our own. There always had to be a local person with us. But when we went to Bolivia, that was a much safer country, and we could go wherever we wanted, especially in the city of La Paz. But one of the things that really struck me about Colombia was the hunger that people had for God. I remember one day in Cali on the first year that we were there, 2008, you took us in a minibus away up to the statue of Jesus, which dominated the whole city of Cali. And I think it was Ronnie Orr and I got into conversation with a man who was in a car. And he told us that he had lived in America for quite a few years, but he had also had polio when he was young. And it left him with a walking difficulty. He never got out of the car, so we didn't see how difficult it was for him to walk. But I just said to him, look, would you like us to say a prayer for you? So Ronnie and I, through the open uh, door of the car, uh, we prayed for him. And when we finished, he said, I, I feel great peace. And then other people saw what was happening. And they came running over. And before long, there was a whole crowd came. A girl got off a motorbike. She parked the motorbike and came running to get a prayer. And then there was a man, he closed his business. and came running to get a prayer. And the whole team were there, praying for people who were queued up for about an hour. And I think then, Hendrik, that you decided it was time to go. And we all got into the minibus and headed off, even though there were still lots of people there who would have left there. But it showed me the hunger that people had prepared to receive a prayer out there in the open air when people back in, in Europe would probably be much more worked about that. So you, you found you find Hendrik that there's there's a much greater hunger in Colombia than there would be say in Holland for the gospel. Is that right? Well to tell you the truth, Brother David, it, it hasn't always been like that. It was uh, early in early days it was more difficult. Yes we began to feel like a change in the spiritual atmosphere uh, after the stadium. And uh, that was really, really powerful, then, you know, when the church got, to, got together to pray out, out of a, a tremendous crisis, actually, because the mafia war was approaching Cali. And uh, people were afraid that the, there'd be war in Cali like in just before, before that, when uh, thousands of people were killed, actually, in that mafia. And it brought the church to come together to pray. And, and that was a, a wonderful thing, because the mafia leaders surrendered to the authorities without any resistance. But also the spiritual atmosphere had been affected in such a way that we were just experiencing an open heaven. And, and people were so open after that and so hungry for God. And it's still there, you know, it's still there. It's wonderful in a football stadium and maybe 50,000 people coming to an all night prayer meeting. And, uh, that was really just absolutely astonishing. So you're back with us again, Hendrik. I think we lost you there for a moment. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I was just talking about, you know, the uh, approaching mafia war in Cali. Yes. Because earlier people were that open. Uh, but after after those prayer meetings in the stadium in the early and mid nineties, we began to experience a, a change in the spiritual atmosphere, and yes. people became oh, God. Yeah, that's, see, that's interesting actually because Fergus, you have always been very enthusiastic about unity between Christians here in Ireland. And the 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 days of prayer that we have had on Sundays, the art of prayer between three and four. It was called by yourself, Fergus, and Christians from a number of different groups and, and backgrounds. And maybe that'll be an encouragement for us to, to stay together, keep that spirit of unity, 
uh, once this particular crisis is over, so that we don't lose the momentum and that we can keep pressing forward. Amen. Henrik, I'm reminded, just as Brother David speaks, sir, do, do you remember the, the evening we went to the church in Sucre, the little Pentecostal church where, um, and I've shared this a couple of times, where towards the end they actually prayed for, for us. They prayed for uh, Johnny Kennedy, who's with us, for Brother David, myself, and yourself, and they gathered us round, and as they prayed, someone said that they saw two angels at the bottom of, of, of the, the small church, and they knew nothing about our politics in Ireland or about our colors, but they say that strange. I see two big angels, and that each of them are wearing like a banner or a sash, and uh, one sash is orange, and the other sash is green. And if you remember, both of us started to weep, and then this perfume smell fell on us. And uh, again, it was a very sick. Just I realized, I whispered to you, do they realize the significance of those two colors? Yourself from the House of the Orange from Holland and ourselves from Ireland. And at the time, we just knew there was something, we, we've no politics except the, the kingdom of the Lord. But in some way, maybe the Lord was whispering something about what his heart is for Ireland and for Holland. Yeah, I'm sure that the local people had no idea about the colors. It was so much the Holy Spirit ministering to us. I felt immediately when, when, when he saw those there was such a, a, an aroma in the in the atmosphere, and even even in a natural perfume, I had never never sensed that before. It, it was really amazing. And I remember between two of us, I don't know how to call it, liberation cry like that had been broken in the world and and huge. That was really powerful for me. Remember that experience very well. Yeah, you know that. that uh, that was a very powerful night, and I think there's some writing saying that the pastor that night was also a medical doctor, and he was a hospital consultant. So he had, he had, he had a dual role. That particular night, something happened to me, which doesn't always happen to me. I was standing there just in the time of worship, and I wasn't singing. I was just soaking it in, and suddenly with my eyes closed, this was a church with a Judeo Christian tradition, I think. But just with my eyes closed, I just got a picture of the cross and Jesus on the cross. And I felt God say to me very clearly, if I would do that for you 2,000 years ago, go through all that suffering, go up on the cross for each and every one of you. There is no limit to what I will do for you today. And that just came to me very, very clearly. But it was a very powerful experience, and, and the, the worship wasn't noisy at that stage. It was very quiet. And just in the quietness, God spoke to me, but I've never forgotten that image. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Remember you mentioned that Brother David after a time of prayer, after that meeting. And, and just so many, so many wonderful things that happened. On Angel, for example, you know, the big guy who came to us in La Paz. Yes. We were invited for breakfast. The right. And he had had a terrible night. We had never met him before. He was locked away in his room. He was, he didn't even want to come out. That's but his right. wife came over. And eventually he decided to come out from his room. And he, he just looked at you all the time. He's, he was <laughs> drunk. The anointing you carry. And he was... You know, and, and just a few nights later, we were praying for him for deliverance and, mm. and breaking that he had, you know, with the evil one and him receiving yeah. Christ. He has been baptized soon after that by the group in La Paz. And he's really well, you know. Yes, I, I remember that morning well when we, um, when, we, when we were there for breakfast. I think we arrived in the early hours of Friday morning. And this was Saturday morning, and there were about a dozen people, like 12 people really, in the room and all around the table having breakfast. And the wife opened up about her difficulties, and it was a difficulty in relationship. And yeah. Somehow or other, I got onto forgiveness. And she and I were talking to one another at opposite ends of the table, and everybody else was quiet and listening. And it was as if there were only the two of us there. And I was telling her how to forgive. And she was drinking it in. She really needed it. I think she and the husband had a lot of tension in the relationship. 
relationship for quite some time. But she was drinking it in. And that again showed me, you know, she really wanted it. She was hungry to find out how to forgive. And, and that might have been the beginning of his healing, because he came in slightly later. And then he kind of stayed with us for the rest of the trip. Yeah, yeah, it was amazing. And you know that, and then we went to the bus for uh, many hours, actually a long trip to yes. Potos. It was a very, very difficult city. That's right. We remember, we were out. We were invited by one or two churches, but as soon as uh, out, we had to stop in in two or three. Churches, I believe there's so many invitations to yes. different places. Yes, uh, I think we should tell the people when we were in Potosi, we were ministering at 15,000 feet, and uh, in La Paz it's 13,000 feet, but 15,000 feet. And uh, I remember we slept, I think, in a youth hostel that night, and I remember waking up in the middle of the night, and I was struggling a bit for breath. I don't know why that should be, uh, because in 2015, when we were there for the first time, I found it very easy. But 2018, I, I, I found it more difficult. But I could just say that I had an experience there at that particular time. I got a yellow fever injection just a short time before we had to go uh, to Bolivia. And uh, I'm not sure whether we needed it or not, to tell you the truth. I think you felt that we didn't. But somehow or other, it had an effect upon me. And I, I was really feeling tired, if not exhausted, most of the time. And I decided the only way I was going to get through the whole experience was moment by moment to draw on the grace of God. And if I was sitting waiting to get up and speak, he was saying, Lord, you're going to have to give me the strength to walk over to the platform. Give me the strength to walk up onto the platform, to go over to the microphone and to speak. And moment by moment, literally, I was drawing on the grace of God. So on the way home, with Johnny and Ferguson myself, I said to the to the boys, you know, you boys don't realize how tired I was during the whole of that trip, and I was drawn on the grace of God moment by moment. And I've never forgotten what both of them said. They said, we would never have noticed. And I said, that's absolutely fantastic. I was exhausted, but drawn on the grace of God, I was able to give the impression that there was nothing wrong with me. So I think I would just say to anybody who's out there, who's facing a difficulty, don't be afraid to draw on the grace of God moment by moment if you have to. And if you do that, it might just transform the way you feel the circumstances that you're in. Amen, amen. And this is just one of the, and truth, this is what I hoped would happen tonight, that um, people would be able to eavesdrop and, and, and just sharing what the Lord is about. And, Maybe just I'm conscious just we're coming up to five minutes straight. I know some people might want to go out and clap at eight o'clock for our frontline workers. Maybe uh, just in the last few moments, I'd love to hear what, what do you sense God's saying and doing in this particular time that we're in, Henrik and David? And maybe that would lead us finally just to we love both of you, maybe just to pray towards the end. But what, what do you sense God is doing or saying through this particular season that the whole world finds itself in at the moment? I'll let Henrik go first. Well, well, actually, I, I've still been around going through a number of churches, you know. In spite of the quarantine, I've been invited to speak on, on the internet and on streaming service and so on. And it's really marvelous that the church, uh, I, it's funny, like a, like a liquid, you know, like a cruise. And it cannot be trapped by anything. But what I've noticed a lot around here in Holland is Psalm 91 has been mentioned all the time. Yes. Uh, it's a wonderful psalm, of course, and it's very significant for us because years ago when the Lord began to show us how we were to start in Cali, Colombia, we prayed about the name, going through some very difficult circumstances back then as a nation. And the name of the church, the Most High, which is inspired by Psalm 91. So it's really wonderful to see Psalm here now being being so relevant in Holland, and I suppose in many other places as well. I, I suppose we don't have to, I would encourage the listeners to read themselves and show that a lot of 
time and encourage you. I, I think that maybe what I would say that I was aware for a few years now that there's just been a away from God here in this country. You know, church attendance in, in a lot of places uh, would be going down. Laws are being brought in which are maybe not in keeping with what God would want. And I think that God has given us an opportunity to come back to him. In fact, I think he is saying, I want you to come back to me. There won't be any price to pay anything. He gives us that very generous invitation as he always does, uh, just really to come back to him. But I think that once again, we have found here how we're never helpless actually when we run into a difficulty like this. And that there's been such a volume of prayer. It wasn't organized by me. It was by groups like your own Fergus and the other prayer group uh, leaders uh, calling us all together to pray. And I think that while it was forecast here that there's going to be a surge of the coronavirus, uh, that surge never seems to have come. And people, your uh, spokespeople keep saying oh, people are social distancing and all that sort of thing. That's a factor. But nobody is taking into consideration the volume of prayer that's going on that I think has held the coronavirus back. And I think that what we need to do now is keep up the momentum, not lose the momentum, keep up the momentum and get this illness out of here as quickly as we possibly can. Amen. Wonderful. Amen. Um, I'm conscious that just as we come to a close here, and I, I'd love this to continue for hours in truth, as it did in, in La Paz and Sucre and those places in, in Bolivia, but I'm conscious of for people watching. Maybe both of you could lead us finally in prayer. And I'm conscious we're going to be, maybe, David, you, you could pray for Tia as well over in Colombia. I know from some people watching, maybe already just coming out of having treatment for the COVID-19 or impacted in their families and relationships and maybe different worries that they have. So it would be a great gift if both of you could lead us just in, in prayer to finish off this, this time together. Maybe Hendrik, if you would like this to begin. Yes, thank you, Fergus. Father, we thank you tonight for your goodness that in the midst of crisis and difficulties, you shine, Lord, your power becomes more evident. And, and uh, I just want to, to join in with Brother David when he, when he said that we need to come back to God. And I, I just pray, Lord, that we will be turned back to you, that, that in circumstances, conditions will repent. And, and to the, the, as that you are the, the Lord of Lords, that you are the truth and the life. Lord, thank you for this time. It's been it's really wonderful in spite of all the pain and difficulty. It's been a time of, of uh, becoming more conscious of your of the need for God, and, and we just pray, Lord, you bless, you bless our name, that the church be awakened and uh, and become become act effective again, Lord, and powerful. We pray for revival for Northern Ireland as well. Lord, your your Spirit visiting that place, Lord, a place of thank you for the Northern Ireland. They are wonderful people, Lord, uh, and we thank are joined together by you. Thank you for this time, Jesus. Amen. 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 And Lord, I, I thank you for the chance just to be uh, with Hendrik again and with Fergus through this Zoom uh, broadcast here. Thank you for the great welcome that Hendrik and Tia have always given us, first of all in Colombia and then, Lord, in Bolivia. Lord, I have said that that Hendrik is one of the great men produced by the church worldwide in the 20th century. And when I think of the well over 30 years of service he has given in Colombia, when it was often a very dangerous situation to be in, uh, I think I understand, Lord, why I said that. And I thank you for what we have learned, actually, from those trips to Colombia and to Bolivia as well, and the welcome that the people there have given us, and the hunger that we have found amongst them, Lord, for you some of which we have been able to bring back and to share with our own people in Northern Ireland. And I just pray that the things that you're saying to us now, that you're trying to teach us at this period of lockdown, we have a, an unprecedented opportunity, Lord, to be alone with you, to be quiet with you, to listen to you. Help us to hear what you're saying and to be obedient so that renewal and revival 
then come to this land once again and you'll be given your rightful place amongst us. In Jesus' name.